you're going to have to revisit Narnia here again. I'm sorry, but it won't be talking about we won't be talking about uh, the books. Actually, we're going to be talking about the person and his bewitching influence. And um, many of you have been influenced by C.S. Lewis indirectly, and you don't realize it. You know, many of you have been through other writers and through other people. You have been influenced by his books. Some of you have read some of his books. Some of you have have uh, had them read. Uh, have your children have read them, or you've watched a cartoon on them, or they've watched a movie on them, or something like that. And there is a bewitching influence on those books. And um, the, there's, he is a, a very bewitching man. He was a very bewitching man in a lot of ways. Some of the things that he wrote about very dark. Now, I cannot rehash what, what we did in the first couple messages because the second message was 85 minutes long. It was very long, um, but that's okay because I know people that will sit down and watch three hours of a football game. And if you can't handle three hours of instructions and teachings like that, then... Maybe your heart's in the wrong place, amen? Because uh, I, I know a lot of people that for if, if, the, if the game goes into overtime, they're excited about it. If the preaching goes into overtime, it's like, oh, man. You know, uh-oh, that's bad, right? And, um, but, and listen, and some of you may think in your heart that this is not profitable for me. Well, it is. Because all, all things that are based in reproving and rebuking are, prop, are profitable for you. Okay, especially when the, the when when we're the Bible commands us to try the spirits. It commands us to. And in order to do that, we have to test them and try them. We've got to we've got to be able to judge these things. But let me ask you a question. If if someone you knew reached millions of people, actually like a hundred million people, a hundred million copies of books have been sold or something like that. I think it was just an astronomical amount. If someone reached that many people and bewitch them and influence them. If your family member or your loved one was stuck into that, would you want somebody to tell them the truth? Would you want somebody to tell them? What if somebody, you know, you, right now you and I, we don't know who this is going out to. You don't know who it's going to be used in your own life right now. You don't know who you're going to, you street evangelists don't know who you're going to run across. By the way, did you know that most, a lot of the people that you run, that he was one of the first guys with this relativity type of understanding of things, of scriptures and this, and this use of that. He was one of the first guys to really use that and to really push that type of thing and to make evolution this, or not evolution, but make theology this evolving thing. But see, if you don't know that, if you're not equipped with that, then somebody comes up to you. And I mean, listen, I've had people, I, I can't tell you how many, I remember, and I didn't know anything about him at the time, but I remember back in 1990, or early 2000s, uh, early 2000, like 2005, well, 2005, 2006. Around that time, I remember I used to sell a lot of books. I used to sell a ton of books online. I used to make a lot of money doing it too. I mean, I'd pick up a book for like a dollar and I'd sell it sometimes for a hundred bucks. I mean, I was just good at it. I knew how to do it, and the Lord really blessed me with it, and I used it for extra income, and I used it to build my own library up to buy the things that I wanted. But I remember running across this guy named C.S. Lewis. I had no idea who he was. I didn't even read his books, okay? I really didn't. But I'd just put them on eBay, and I'd buy them for like 80 cents, and I'd watch them like skyrocket. It's like, why do people like this guy? Who is this guy? I don't even know who he is. And, you know, being a young Christian, I didn't know. I didn't pay attention to it. And I was like, well, whatever. You know, it's no big deal. And I would sell all his books and everybody would buy him. Well, I feel bad now. I mean, this guy is horrible. It's horribly confusing. But that's why the Bible says to test or it says to try the spirits, which means to test them, which means to judge them. But today, we it's... Everything's relative, and it's no big deal. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. That's the Bible warning from God. 
That's the Bible warning the Apostle Paul gave. And he said, listen, he said, they're going to come and they're going to be false teachers. And there's going to be a time of deception and they're going to deceive. And they're going to be working actually for Lucifer, uh, Satan. And, and, but they're going to come to you like angels of light, though. They're not going to come with a pitchfork and looking like the devil. And that's why these things are so deceptive. They're not going to come to that that way. But you know what I find to be rather evil? is the fact that, they, that he marketed these books to children. And these books, these books were, were, were marketed to children. And those are the ones that were deceived. And now we have this C.S. Lewis generation, the last two generations. And they're deceived by it. And they don't realize it. But the title of this message is His Bewitching Influence, Friends, and Also Rome. Ah, all crooked roads lead to Rome. Ah, it's undeniable they do. Well, I want to read you about some of his, his mentors, some of his teachers. See, this is a very thorough, these three messages are going to be very thorough on who this man is, and then we're going to be done. But what it's going to do, what it has done already, and what it is doing is informing thousands of people. This week alone, 16, 1,700 people, 1,800 people have downloaded those sermons. 1,800. By the way, Hollywood Satanic Roots, that sermon on YouTube, 28,000 listens on YouTube. Praise the Lord. Lots of people delivered from wickedness. All right, now listen up here. Lewis would credit George MacDonald with having influenced virtually every word he ever wrote. It began with Fantastus, a dreamlike tale in which a boy wishes to visit fairy country. He awakes the next morning in an enchanted wood. Listen to me. Disney has a brand new movie out right now called the wood in the woods into the woods thank you into the woods pure witchcraft pure witchcraft c.s lewis had the wood between the worlds you have to understand something about fairies about witchcraft and everything else and i'm not going to stand here because i don't have time but you have to understand, all of it is done in the woods look at all the stories about woods all of them are about woods. Little Red Riding Hood going through the woods. All of these things about woods. Why? Because that's where they practice magic. I know, I shouldn't be so cut and dry. He awakes the next morning in an enchanted wood where he encounters profound happiness mixed with perilous adventure, including death and rebirth of sorts. By the way, this was an Anglican priest, this George MacDonald. I think he was Anglican. He was actually uh, kicked out of his church for heresy. And so thanks to the imagination of George MacDonald, C.S. Lewis found his way home. When, he said, when God created Adam, this is what George MacDonald said in one of his books, when God created Adam... Not out of nothing, as say the unwise, but out of his own endless glory, he brought me an angelic splendor to be my wife. Oh, you mean Eve? Uh-uh. There she, Lilith, lies. For her first thought was power. She had so ensnared the heart of the great shadow, Satan, that he became her slave, wrought her will, and made her queen of hell. Vilest of God's creatures, she lives by the blood and lies in souls of men. That's from the book Lilith by George MacDonald. Where does Lilith come from? The Kabbalah. Lilith was the, the mythological first wife of Adam. Lilith is a spirit, by the way. It is the same spirit that you'll find of Je that talks about the spirit of Jezebel and other things in the Bible. It is the female deity of a god or of God that they teach. All the esoteric religions teach it. So here you have his number one 
mentor, he said. This guy, I learned everything from him in his book. He wrote, Why would a Christian pastor write about a false wife for Adam named Lilith that comes directly from the, from, from the mystical, wicked Kabbalah and just call it science fiction? Folks, we're not that dumb, are we? We really aren't, are we? To fall for this and accept this. C.S. Lewis never hid his fascination with mystical fantasy. 17 years later, after his conversion to Christianity, to Christianity, he wrote the following endorsement of Lilith and other books by George MacDonald in his 1948 book, George MacDonald, an Anthology. I regarded George MacDonald as my master. Indeed, I fancy I have never written a book in which I did not quote from him. Introducing McDonald's Lilith, Lewis wrote this. He, George McDonald, was born in 1824. In 1850, received what is technically known as a call to become the minister of a dissenting chapel in Arunda. By, by 1852, he was in trouble with the deacons for heresy. Oh, that's not surprising. The charges being that he had expressed belief in a future state of probation for heathens and that he was trained with German theology. What is he saying here? He's saying that the guy that he learned from did not believe in hell. He believed in purgatory. And so did Lewis because it's in all his writings. Now, can you explain to me why orthodox, for lack of a better term, or fundamental Christians and those of that sort, why they would ever accept his writings? When the guy did not believe the Bible, he was a heretic. He did not believe the Bible. And he did not believe in the errancy of Scripture either. He believed it was, it was filled with errors. And he, and he said that Jesus Christ erred. Flatly, I showed you that last week. What he does best is fantasy. Fantasy that hovers between the allegorical and the mythopoic. This is, an, in my opinion, he does better than any man. He's talking about George MacDonald. It must be more than 30 years ago, he said, that I bought the Everyman edition of Fantastis. A few hours later, I knew that I had, listen, that I had crossed a great frontier. I had already been waist deep in romanticism and likely enough at any moment to flounder into its darker and more evil forms. This is a Christian man saying this. He's not. He was a witch. <clears throat> Slithering down the steep descent that leads from the love of strangeness to that of eccentricity, and thence to that of perversity. Nothing was at that time further from my thoughts than Christianity, and I therefore had no notion what this difference really was. I was only aware that if this new world was strange, it was homely and humble, that if this was a dream, it was a dream in which one at least felt strangely vigilant, that the whole book also had about it a sort of cool, morning innocence, and also quite unmistakably a certain quality of death, good death. What it actually did to me was to convert, even to baptize, that was there the death came in, my imagination. It did nothing to my intellect, nor at the time to my conscience. Now to me what he's saying is he just got baptized into the occult. That's what he's telling you in his mind. That's what just happened to him. The quality which he had enchanted me in his imaginative works turned out to be the quality of the real universe. The divine, magical, terrifying, and ecstatic reality in which we all live. I don't live there, do you? Lilith, a romance it was called. Off Lilith, says the Kabbalah. Lilith is the first text to employ the idea of going through a mirror into another world. This is George MacDonald. I'll be done with him in a second. Lilith is a figure of myth. Adam's first wife and a fulcrum of the narr narrator's ambiguous journey. Tensions of human, animal, good, evil, body, spirit, and angel, vampire, play through the text, finally emerging in a violent conflict. That's what Lilith was about. This is a Christian recommending, this is supposed to be a Christian recommending you read this, and recommended all his books, and said all of his books were based off of this. 
Well, I know it was because you're based off the Kabbalah. Everything you did, all that magical stuff, all that, that, that yin and yang, good versus evil, that balance that we're all animals, really, that thing, all that concepts come from the Kabbalah. All of that, so the Big Bang comes from the Kabbalah. Evolution from the Kabbalah. All of it comes from the Kabbalistic writings. All of those things do. And that's provable, by the way. Completely provable. So the question you have to ask yourself is, who hath bewitched you? It's the question you have to ask. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Why is there a need by these people for fantasy and magic? And why is, there, why is it acceptable for Christians today to watch movies and to watch things with fantasy and magic in it? Why? Because they have never tasted the power of God. Yeah. That is why. They have never tasted and seen that the Lord is good. They have never had God's power on their life. They have never seen the miracles of God. They have never seen the answered prayer and the power of God to change lives. They haven't seen it, so they desire something else. They desire something darker. Shame on you for making excuses for why you, and you watch wickedness and other things. It's a shame. It's, it's an absolute downright shame to make excuses for why evil is watched and entertained yourself on. It's evil. So suffer not a witch to live in. God hates witchcraft, yet you watch it on a screen? You watch them conjure up things and mock things, and, and they're, they're, they're initiating into things, and they're showing you things, and they're mocking the whole time you're God. And you're paying them money, and they're getting wealthy off of, off of mocking God. And God's people are paying for it. Shame. That was a little bit of preaching there instead of just facts for you. That's how that comes in. Okay, now who was influenced by this man? A great number of people was. How about this? And this influenced many lives. C.S. Lewis was definitely some sort of universalist, and, he had, and, has, and he's had a wide influence. Clark Pinnock, you ever heard of him? Clark Pinnock, some of you haven't, but he's a very popular man. I've got some of his books actually in my library. Who denies eternal fiery hell and credits Lewis as a major influence. He's a theologian. I've got to, I mean, I think Moody produced his books. Moody Bible Press or Moody Press produced his books. And he denies eternal fiery hell. And he credits Lewis as a major influence. He said this, When I was a young believer in the 1950s, C.S. Lewis helped me understand the relationship between Christianity and other religions in an inclusivist way because I trusted him as an orthodox thinker. I was open to hear him say that he could detect God's presence among other faiths and that he believed people could be saved in other religions because God was at work among them. Wait a minute. That sounds like Billy Graham. The wideness to God's mercy. Remember that? And Robert Schuller and Joel Olstein and they were oh wait, and the Pope? Yeah, same spirit. His view was wonderfully summed up for me in that incident in the last battle, the last volume of the Narnia cycle, where the pagan soldier Emmeth learns to his surprise that Aslan, the lion, which represents Jesus Christ, regards his worship of Tash as directed to himself. Anyone who appreciates that incident is on his or her way to inclusivist thinking. Do you, do you realize what he just said? Now, I went over this on Wednesday. If you listen to that message, you will understand that he said, if you serve Tash, which is Satan in that, and Aslan, which is supposed to be Christ in that, right? He's saying that I count that as service to me. That's what he said. And C.S. Lewis said that Aslan is Christ in that story. So he is telling you that if you worship Satan, who is Tash, the whole time, then Aslan at the end will say, hey, you are worshiping me. Pinnock says he learned that theology and that understanding from C.S. Lewis, and he believes the same thing. So does Billy Graham, who has, who has pushed millions of people into that and has stated those same facts. Wait a minute. Billy Graham's association recommends C.S. Lewis, and Billy Graham denies the exist, eternal existence of hell. Remember? 
Where did he get it from? C.S. Lewis. That's where they got it from. Elsewhere, Pinnock says this, Scripture encourages us to see the church not so much as the ark, outside of which there is no hope of salvation, but as the vanguard of those who have experienced the fullness of God's grace made available to all people in Jesus Christ. I welcome the Hinduists, basically, uh, the literature of Hinduism. He says, I welcome their books. I don't. I burn them. <clears throat> which celebrate a personal God of love. And the emphasis on grace that I see in the Japanese Shinshu Amida sect. I also respect the Buddha as a righteous man. And Muhammad as the prophet figure in the style of Old Testament. How about emerging church leader Rob Bell? You ever heard of him? Well, this guy. Who denies the eternal fiery hell and believes that atheists can be saved without faith in Christ, credits C.S. Lewis as a major influence in his book, Love Wins. Hey, we just covered that, what love really is, didn't we? How about that timing for that? In the acknowledgments, Bell writes to my parents, Rob and Helen, for suggesting when I was in high school that I read C.S. Lewis. So where do you think Rob Bell got the idea that all, all roads lead to Rome? Well, they do. Uh, all of the roads. <laughs> the narrow way leads to Christ. But the other, we'll get to that in a second, actually, because Rome's going to come into this. All right, David Cloud noted this. The enigma of C.S. Lewis was no more than a slight bemusement to me until recently three things changed my bemusement into bewilderment. He said he studied this, and he was like, this is insane. What, what, what is the deal with this guy? Just like I did when I seen his books, I was like, why is everybody going nuts? Because when I look at them, they don't make any sense. They just sound really stupid, to be honest with you. In March 1994, the Evangelicals and Catholics Together movement produced its first document. Now listen. This was a pro programmatic document entitled Evangelicals and Catholics Together, the Christian Mission in the Third Millennium. It was rightly said at this time that this document represented a betrayal of the Reformation. Okay, I saw no connection between this and C.S. Lewis until a couple of years later when the symposium Evangelicals and Catholics Together, working towards a common mission, was published. In his contribution to the work, to the book, Charles Colson, Chucky Colson, the evangelical prime mover behind the ECT tells us that C.S. Lewis was a major influence which led him to form the movement Billy Graham was another. In fact, Colson says the evangelicals and Catholics together seeks to continue the legacy of C.S. Lewis by focusing on the core beliefs of all true Christians. The enigma took on a more for foreboding aspect. Do you understand that there are millions of people in these organizations, and they all believe this. They're all stuck in this, and they believe it because some theologian that is so popular among people, he's influenced millions. The enigma, David Cloud goes on to say, the enigma darkened, darkened further when just last year, after becoming connected to the internet, this was at the, in 1996 when he wrote this, I discovered quite by accident that C.S. Lewis is just as popular among Roman Catholics as he is amongst evangelicals. Perhaps I should have known this already, but it never struck me before. The third shock came last autumn when I read that Christianity Today reputed to be the leading evangelical magazine in the USA, had conducted a poll amongst its readers to discover whom they considered the most influential theological writers of the 20th century. You will have already guessed that C.S. Lewis came out on top. In April of 1998, Mormon professor... Oh, the Mormons? Are you starting to get this? Are, are you understanding this? This is all an ecumenical movement. Who is C.S. Lewis talking about? Who is George MacDonald talking about? What is all that they are pushing? Antichrist. They were describing, describing Antichrist in a crafty way. And you have to understand that they're all part of the conspiracy. And they're all coming together. And they're around writings that witches have said, there's a witch named Silverhawk that says that she was initiated into, 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 into witchcraft by C.S. Lewis's writings. Maybe she's lying, because, you know, she's not a Christian, she's not a fundamental Baptist, but 
Maybe she's just working for Baptist preachers. That must be what it is. No, she just told you the truth. And anybody that reads his books can understand that's what's in them. If you if you understand if you read them through the through the eyes of truth anyway that is if you try the spirits. Okay, in, in April of 1998, Mormon professor Robert Malay spoke at Wheaton College on the topic of C.S. Lewis. How about that, huh? Mormon professor Wheaton College, where John R. Rice started the Sword of the Lord in the basement. How about that? In the basement of Wheaton College, you remember that? That's when he started. I mean, you don't remember because you weren't there, but remember the history of it? That's where the sword of the Lord started. It was in the basement of that Wheaton College there. In April 1998, Mormon professor Robert Millay spoke to Wheaton College on the topic of C.S. Lewis. What's a Mormon doing speaking to evangelicals about C.S. Lewis? Oh, he's not that important preacher. Just forget about it. In April of 1998, he, he did in a recent issue of Christianity Today, Millay, dean of Brigham Young University. It's nice. It's quoted as saying that C.S. Lewis is so well received by Latter day Saints and Mormons because of his broad and inclusive vision of Christianity. John W. Kennedy, Southern Baptist, take up the Mormon challenge. Christianity Today, June 15, 1998. I'll take up a Mormon challenge. I'll go outside of all the Mormon temples and preach. That's the Mormon challenge I'll take up. And no, the Mormon is not your brother. He's a lost, deceived sinner that is going to die and go to a devil's hell if he doesn't repent and become born again. You could say that a lot nicer. Yes, I could. Stop following wicked, satanic, perverted, porno mysticism garbage with your special perverted underwear and get right with God. It's sick, it's perverted, it's nasty, it's disgusting, and it stinks in the nostrils of God. Thank you. There you go. It's a perverted doctrine. Celestial underwear, if that ain't the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, magic underwear. Maybe he got that magic underwear from, no, he was around before C.S. Lewis. Anyway, <laughs> I don't want to know. Anyway, uh, Roman Catholics love C.S. Lewis as much as evangelicals do. His books are typically found in Catholic bookstores. Michael Corrin, a Roman Catholic, wrote a biography of Lewis entitled C.S. Lewis. The man who created Narnia. The Catholic news agency Zenit asked Corrin, what do Catholics need to know about C.S. Lewis? They should know he wasn't a Catholic. But that doesn't mean he wouldn't have become one eventually. <laughs> G.K. Chesterton became a Catholic in 1922, but had really been one for 20 years. Really? So that's almost like this guy's admitting that they're really undercover Catholics. Well, that would mean that they were co-opted, and that would mean that they do this on purpose. Oh, okay. That makes sense, because that's what Rome does. They should know he wasn't a Catholic. Lewis was born in Belfast in sectarian Northern Ireland, so he was raised anti-Catholic, like most Protestant children there. He was a man of his background, but his views were very Catholic. He believed in purgatory, believed in the sacraments, and went to confession. Oh, did, does that make you feel better about having C.S. Lewis movies and books? Here's a man that went to confession. Well, who did he confess to? A priest right. of Rome. Right. Why can't people see this? <laughs> the, oh, by the way, the title of his book that he wrote about? that he wrote about C.S. Lewis, The Subtle Magic of C.S. Lewis's Narnia. Michael Corrin's Perspective of the New Movie Looms, December 7, 2005. How come they call it magic, but Christians say it's not magic? <laughs> Why is it okay for Christians to think they're... And am I picking on you? You bet I am, because I'm tired of people covering for evil and wickedness and acting like it's not real while they're all playing games and Satan is laughing. Oh, they're practicing magic and witchcraft and watching it. Oh, it's just fantasy. No, it's not. No, no, it's not. It's really witchcraft, and they're really doing things, and they're really initiating things, and they even say it in their writings, and they're telling you, are, and you're still reading them, and Christians are buying them, and all the Christians are going to Narnia. They're going to the movies, and they're watching those movies. They're like, oh, look at that. Yeah, because magic powers come from this, and I can transport with magic rings and everything. 
it's very frustrating because it's not that hard. But you know what the problem is? You don't want to give up your sin. You want to hold on to Hollywood. You want to hold on to all these wicked movies. You don't want to give up your sin because you want to be entertained. Well, listen, come out to the street with me. You'll be entertained. You'll see, you'll see all kinds of things. Amen? You'll be able to put a smile on your face while people are cursing you and mad at you, and you'll just be praising the Lord and smiling and watching them go down their way, and you'll see all kinds of crazy things. You, you'll see witches. If you want to see witches, go out on the street. You'll see witches. You'll be rebuking them in Jesus' name. They're out there. You want to see sorcerers? They're out there. They're all there. How about you live in reality? Lewis carried a, on a warm correspondence in Latin with a Catholic priest. Yeah, I can see I could do that, really. Yeah. Uh, I, I, wouldn't that be just, Brother Paul, you can imagine a warm correspondence. A warm correspondence with a Catholic priest. How? How could you stomach it? How could you even stomach it without vomiting all over the place? How could you talk to him like that and have this, this grand correspondence and not rebuke him for it? Oh. Lewis carried on a warm correspondence in Latin with Catholic priest Don Giovanni Calabria of Italy over their shared concern for the reunification of the Christian churches. Well, now, how about that? Are you telling me that, I mean, that that was the plan? I mean, can it get any easier than that? I get in trouble if I say Jesuit. People get mad at me for saying Jesuit. But I'm just trying to figure out how this guy, oh, by the way, that same priest, check this out, that same priest, was beautified by Pope John Paul II in 1998. 1988, excuse me. Well, wonder what for. <laughs> well, I mean, it, I don't know. It could be that he was the handler for C.S. Lewis. Could be. Could be. I mean, there might be some kind of possibility that that kind of thing could go on. But, of course, we know that Rome wouldn't do that, Brother Paul, would they? They're loving people. They they certainly wouldn't want to counter the Reformation. So now I have to stop and say, okay, where, what are all these Reformed people doing promoting C.S. Lewis when C.S. Lewis was anti-Reformation and said it was not necessary and they were just a bunch of pharisaical bigots that did it? Uh-oh! Why are all these Reformation Christians and Reformed Christians supporting C.S. Lewis when he hated the Reformation? He said it. He said they're a bunch of bigots. A bunch of pharisaical guys is all they were. Boy, the facts are really hard to get around, aren't they? They really are. What's that, brother? Amen. Hey, that's right. <laughs> the heresy of salvation. Apart from faith in Christ and a growing number of evangelicals hold to this false doctrine, believing that God will somehow receive unbelievers and followers of false religions, even though they do not bow to the lordship and sole saviorhood of Jesus Christ through repentance and personal faith. David Cloud goes on to say this, When I interviewed the head of the New Testament department at, at Saramapur University, founded by William Carey, by the way, in India, in the early 1980s, he did this interview. He told me the same thing. I asked him whether the Hindus will be accepted by God if they are sincere in their religion. He replied, certainly. At that time, there were, this was the premier theological institution in India, and it provided accreditation for other schools. From the 1940 to the end of his life, Lewis's spiritual advisor was a Catholic priest named Walter Adams. Or that could have been his handler, I'm not sure. Um, it, it was this priest that Lewis confessed his sins. So... I mean, that is kind of weird, right? That a guy that calls himself an evangelical Christian or is lifted up by the evangelicals? Why would that guy be confessing his sins to a priest? And then a greater question is, now that you know this, why would any of us hold on to anything that man ever did? Amen? 
Listen to this. We're, we're almost done for this hour because I'm not going to take this. Uh, I'm going to finish this up later in the next hour. But uh, from the 1940s to the end of his life. Anyway, Peter Kreft, a convert to Rome from the Dutch Reformed denomination, he converted to Roman Catholicism. He says, C.S. Lewis was one of the many strands of the rope that hauled me aboard the ark. I'd like to be known as that guy, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like to be known in your writing as the guy that brought people home, home, parentheses, to the mother of all harlots? She's not the mother church. She is the mother of all harlots. C.S. Lewis' correspondence and information I gleaned from oral history interviews reveal that Lewis met Father Adams every Friday unless one of them needed to be out of town. Father Adams' impact on Lewis during the dozen years they met was unquestionably transformational. Adams was an Anglo-Catholic, and he gently but purposely, purposefully led Lewis to become a high churchman. Thanks to Adams, Lewis learned to love liturgy, the 1662 prayer book, the daily office, and praying through the Psalter each month. It was Adams who helped Lewis learn that the Eucharist is more than a memorial and symbol. Yeah, it's witchcraft. Indeed, Adams helped the increasingly popular writer experience real presence in the Blessed Sacrament. You, you get what he's saying, right? He's saying he's really drinking the blood and he's really eating the body. Transubstantiation is what he's saying there. And don't ever try to convince me that Lewis didn't understand what he was doing. Yeah. Uh, they call it substantia or something like that, I think, but I can't remember. Yeah, some of them do. Some of them, well, some of them made their pact back with Rome, too. So, I mean, that, that's already been decided uh, for most of them. Anyway, Adams helped the increasingly popular writer. Okay, Adams also introduced Mr. Lewis to the writings of Richard Mew Benson, the founder of the Society of St. John the Evangelist. And from Father Benson's works, Lewis gradually gained a longing for holiness, admiration, and pre sixth century church fathers. A heart for evangelism and a soul transformational mystical knowledge of what it means to be in the Paulian terms in Christ. Now, this is by somebody that, that actually agrees with him. However, I'm trying to figure out how you could have that love for that and then write magical books. Because it's not the Christ that they're looking for, that's why. Even C.S. Lewis, the darling of the Protestant evangelicals, smelled Catholic most of the time. Lewis is the only author I've ever read whom I thought I could completely trust and completely understand. But he believed in purgatory, the real presence in the Eucharist, and not total depravity. He was no Calvinist. In fact, he was medieval. That's what Peter Kreft said. Well, what he's telling you is, is that Lewis's theology came from the medieval times, which is what? Kabbalistic mystical magic. That's what it is. Tainted. Here's another quote here. Lewis has been dubbed an evangelical rock star by the New York Times. But as the New Yorker noted, both mainline Protestants and Catholics also lay claim to him. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia excuse me, invoked Lewis's letters in an interview with New York Magazine, and U2 frontman Bono named him in an interview with Focus on the Family. And those guys are one-worlders. Antichrist. Lewis has been, published, has been a publishing phenomenon, says Mickey Modlin, senior vice president of Harper One, who became a Christian by reading Lewis, surprised by joy at 20 years, one years old. Lewis is claimed as one of us by Mormons, Catholics, mainline Protestants, as well as evangelicals. No. They, most of them want nothing to do with him. Most of them want nothing to do with him. No, most of them aren't, because when you ask a Baptist about those, most bad. well, there is one coming up, John Piper. I'll save that for the next hour. He's going to be the one that's going to make that Baptist and Billy, was Billy Graham Methodist or Southern Baptist? I can't remember. Southern Baptist, I thought so, yeah. Yeah, well, they're riddled with Freemasonry. So that's just the way it goes. Anyway, all right, we're going to stop right now. Go ahead and stop that, brother. And we'll pick this up and finish this in the last half of the afternoon.